On February 28, 2022, in response to the Russian invasion of their territory, Ukraine formally applied for membership in the European Union. Publicly, the Ukrainian government expressed confidence that they would be admitted quickly. President Zelensky even suggested that Ukraine could join immediately under a new special procedure. But even though Ukraine's bid had, and still has, widespread support throughout Europe, the reality is that Zelensky's special procedure for immediate admission doesn't exist and no one actually expected Ukraine to join anytime soon. So why does it take so long to join the EU? Why did Ukraine even bother to apply when they did if they weren't going to be admitted right away? And how much longer does Ukraine have to wait? Well, these questions aren't as simple as they sound. In order to even start to answer them, you first have to understand how the EU works and how it incorporates new members over time. The EU today is made up of 27 independent countries, but 21 of them weren't originally members of the organisation that preceded the EU when it was founded back in the 1950s. Standards for joining have developed over time. Since 1993, the guiding principles for membership have been the so-called Copenhagen criteria. The core requirements are that any potential member must be a functioning democracy that respects human rights and has a well-developed market economy. But the key thing is how the EU expects this to be accomplished through stability of institutions. This idea isn't just a requirement for admission, it's reflected in the structure and even the values of the broader EU as a whole. Institutions, organisations, agreements, these bureaucratic structures aren't just an important part of the EU, it would actually be fair to argue that they are the EU. Now this is something that the EU is commonly criticised for, and to be fair, the EU's bureaucracy is complicated. Very complicated. But despite the complexity, the structure of the EU allows it to be what it is, a group of countries that, while still sovereign nations, are able to work together and integrate with each other. At the end of the day, integration is the whole point, and it takes many shapes and forms. Economic integration is the best known example. EU member states share what's called the single market, meaning that goods and services can flow across international borders as though the EU were a single country. Of course, member states integrate in many more ways, and dedicated organisations and agreements are the way that this happens. This can be educational through programmes like Erasmus, legal through organisations like the European Court of Justice, or any number of different things. Of course, because EU countries have continued to integrate with each other over the years, the body of European law continues to grow. Part of being in the EU means adapting these laws and changing how your country works. Since countries that join need to catch up with those already in, the process of joining has become more and more difficult, which helps to answer our first question. Now, because of how EU organisations are structured, they're not always limited to just EU member states. They're also used to help non-EU countries integrate with the EU. A good example of this is the European Common Aviation Area, which allows many non-EU countries to participate in the EU single market, specifically for aviation. And this kind of integration doesn't just apply to countries that might join someday. The natural conclusion to European integration isn't necessarily EU membership. This shows how the idea of integration isn't just how the EU works, it's also the EU's main foreign policy goal. But why is this so important to the EU? There are obvious economic benefits, but it isn't just that. Integration is an important philosophical principle going back to well before the EU was founded. In part, it's meant to make outright conflict impossible. It's easy to overlook how much of a success this has been. France and Germany were bitter rivals for, well, forever, but the idea of them going to war with each other today is laughable. Of course, this approach isn't foolproof. The limited integration with Russia wasn't enough to discourage the invasion of Ukraine, for example. While the integration model might make it difficult to join the EU, there's also a big advantage. If a country might want to become a member someday, the best thing to do is just develop their diplomatic relations with the EU as a whole. For example, if a country wants a free trade agreement with the EU, they have to adopt EU standards to varying degrees, on anything from data security to records management. This can be a burden in some cases, but as part of their developing relationship, the EU provides technical support through their many organisations and financial support through grants and other funding to help countries comply with the requirements. 
For poorer, less stable countries, this helps to improve their stability of institutions. This fulfills the standards of the Copenhagen criteria, but it also means that integration directly contributes to political and economic development. This brings us back to Ukraine and to our second question. By formally applying for membership when they did, Ukraine moved its relationship with the EU forward. On the purely political side of things, this forced the EU to commit to providing them with wartime support, financially, militarily and diplomatically. But it also moved forward the integration side of things. This opened up further technical and financial assistance that is even more important now than ever. Understanding the EU membership as a practical model for development also helps to frame our last question, which will be the focus for the rest of the video. Now in theory, the path is clear. Ukraine needs to develop its economy and continue to strengthen its institutions by adapting EU law. But in practice, it's not clear how long this process will take, especially with the war going on. While answering this question conclusively is impossible, having an understanding of where Ukraine started will give a better idea of where it's headed. Until 1989, most of Eastern Europe was dominated in one form or another by the communist regime in the Soviet Union, but things changed dramatically over just a few years. By 1991, numerous newly independent countries had come into existence, and over time, many of them started to integrate with Western Europe. This eventually led to the EU's dramatic expansion in the mid-2000s, which included several former communist states. Ukraine wasn't an exception to this broad trend of integration, but it had a slower time at it. For one thing, Ukraine is farther from the original EU members than most of the other countries that have joined more recently. But being far from the western part of Europe means that Ukraine has historically been more entrenched in the eastern part of it. Practically speaking, Ukraine's position in the Soviet Union means that it ended up far more tied to Russia than the current EU states that were formerly communist. Maybe the most obvious example of this is the sizable influence of the Russian language. Even many ethnic Ukrainians use, or at least used to use, Russian as their main language, especially in the East and in Kyiv. On top of that, Ukraine has had a sizable ethnic Russian minority, especially in the Donbass region and in Crimea. For these and many other reasons, a good number of Ukrainians, especially in the East, started off less likely to support integration with the EU and more likely to seek closer ties to Russia. Even if Ukraine were ultimately to support more European integration, it would mean that they would have to be less integrated with Russia, and untangling Russian influence is difficult. While EU foreign policy is focused on strengthening the institutions of their neighbours, Russian policy is often driven more by weakening or co-opting them. Meanwhile, the EU itself was barely involved with Ukraine for a long time. While agreements were drafted throughout the 90s and 2000s, the main focus of the EU's enlargement agenda was on countries in its immediate neighbourhood. And even as new members joined and resources started to become available for further expansion, EU public opinion turned against further enlargement. The accession of Bulgaria and Romania was unpopular for many Western Europeans, and the Greek debt crisis led many to question whether integration had gone too far. Later on, perceived democratic backsliding in new Eastern EU members Hungary and Poland has only further complicated things. But at the same time, Ukraine was changing. The first major shift was in 2004 with the so-called Orange Revolution. Widespread reports of electoral fraud led millions of Ukrainians to protest the victory of Viktor Yanukovych, a politician who admittedly had significant support, especially in the country's east. Ultimately, the results were overturned. The administration that followed shifted Ukraine towards a more pro-EU stance, but their poor management of the country, among other things, led to increased support for Yanukovych, who legitimately won the next presidential election in 2010. These events exacerbated the east-west divide in Ukraine, and EU or Russian alignment became a major part of that. It was only a matter of time before these different visions for the future of the country boiled over. As part of their new pro-EU stance, the administration preceding Yanukovych began negotiations with the EU for an association agreement. For Ukraine and several other countries, this document is the first major step towards European integration and eventual membership, and for Ukraine, it was over 2,000 pages. Unsurprisingly, these negotiations took years, 
but about a week before signing, Yanukovych's administration suddenly pulled out, citing the potential damage to their economic relationship with Russia. It became clear over time that Russia itself was exercising significant influence on the Ukrainian government and businesses in order to undermine the agreement. This move was unpopular. For just over three months, protesters occupied Independence Square in Kyiv, clashing regularly with government forces. The protests culminated in the police abandoning the city centre and Yanukovych fleeing the country. The interim government that replaced him signed the agreement shortly after. The fact that so many Ukrainians rose up against their government to fight to be an EU state made a lasting impression in the EU, and the imagery of the protests contrasts sharply with the bureaucracy that the EU often represents. Despite its length and focus on minute details, the association agreement clearly represented the path towards the values and ideals that were so important to a large number of Ukrainians. Of course, the revolution was unpopular for many in the country's east, not to mention in Russia. The Russian government not so covertly supported separatist movements, leading to the Donbass region and Crimea coming under effective Russian control. Years later, as the rest of Ukraine drifted further towards the west, Russia invaded in order to force Ukraine back into its sphere of influence, leading to the situation we're in today. Since 2014, Ukraine's military has radically transformed. While they weren't able to maintain control over Russian-aligned territories in the beginning, Western support for their development, combined with years of combat experience, has allowed them to fight off Russia. This angle is of course important and it's reasonable that a large part of the broader conversation about Ukraine relates to NATO membership and military aid, particularly from the United States. But it's important not to let the military side of things distract from the longer story of institutional development. Despite the Donbass war, a decent amount of progress towards integration had been made. Ukraine had been far enough along in implementing the timeline of reforms in the association agreement that they had planned to formally apply for EU membership in 2024. That is, until the invasion. In this regard, as in many other ways, the Russian invasion has backfired dramatically. Until the war, the EU largely viewed integration and negotiation as the best way to deal with Russia. Now, for the first time in its history, it's relying on military aid. After years of limited interest, expansion is again a major objective for the EU. Admitting Ukraine, as well as countries like Moldova and Georgia, is seen as the best way to keep war and conflict from spreading further into Europe. EU citizens are now highly supportive of Ukrainian membership, and of course, in Ukraine, support for EU membership has skyrocketed, even among the ethnic Russian minority. These changes have hugely accelerated the integration process, but even then, there's a huge amount of work to do. Under normal circumstances, Ukraine would have been expected to fully implement the association agreement before applying, but given their progress and the situation, the EU decided to grant Ukraine candidate status just four months after they applied. Now, this might sound like a long time, but it's actually a record. The average wait time is almost four years. So what exactly does candidate status mean in the world of European bureaucracy? Well, joining the EU requires agreement from all EU member states, and in order for that to happen, the candidate countries need to convince each one of them that they've fully implemented EU law. This is referred to as accession negotiations, and it's a long process that requires further changes to national law and reforms. Generally, countries negotiate several chapters or sets of related laws at a time. Ukraine was provisionally cleared by the EU Commission in November 2023 to start negotiations. Once negotiations start, they take another four years on average, though it's likely Ukraine will take somewhat longer given the context. Despite the war, Ukraine has made good progress. The most recent assessment on Ukraine's chapters put it in a similar position to many other countries at the start of their accession processes in the past. That being said, it's impossible to predict how long the process will take. There's still plenty of room for issues going forward. Of course, the first and most obvious issue is that Ukraine is at war, with a large amount of its territory occupied. This is often seen as a major issue with respect to NATO membership. 
From the EU perspective, it's certainly far from ideal, but it's not actually a deal breaker. EU candidates don't necessarily need to control all of their recognised territories to be admitted. Cyprus was admitted back in 2004, and they still don't control a large part of their claimed territory in the north. That being said, Ukraine is not Cyprus. When Cyprus was admitted, the conflict was… frozen. Meanwhile, Ukraine is in an active state of war, and the country is under martial law. And this could actually be a problem from the EU perspective. You see, holding elections under martial law is prohibited in Ukraine, and since martial law has continued to be extended, the 2023 parliamentary elections didn't happen at the end of October as scheduled. This will very possibly be the case for the 2024 presidential elections as well, meaning that Zelensky will continue to be in power after his term was technically supposed to end. Given that democracy is such an important part of EU standards, the lack of elections could conceivably cause problems for Ukraine's EU bid if the situation drags on for years. More generally, the war seriously complicates what might be the problem for Ukraine's bid that will be the most difficult to solve. The Copenhagen criteria require that a country have the capacity to cope with competitive pressure and market forces within the EU. In short, this means that a new country can't have a much weaker economy than the other countries that are already in. The unfortunate reality is that Ukraine's economy is in shambles. Wartime damage, especially the destruction of the Kohovka Dam, has set Ukraine back years. And at the end of the day, Ukraine was already much poorer than other European countries. Ukraine presents one other unique challenge though. It's huge. With a population of around 40 million, Ukraine would be the fifth most populous country in the EU if it were to join today. That would significantly shift the population centre of the bloc to the east and seriously alter the political balance. Again, given the difficulties between Western and Eastern EU countries over the years, many Western EU countries might be wary of admitting them. It's true that the challenges are significant, but barring any huge changes, Ukraine will probably join the EU… eventually. On the other hand, it's anyone's guess how long it will be before Ukraine's membership process is complete, partly because it will rely in large part on how the war goes. Ukraine is a great example of how the EU's bureaucratic approach to democracy and development can work. Whether the EU and Ukraine rise to the occasion and affirm the value of the system that has been built so far is still an open question, but hopefully now you have a better understanding of how things look going forward. Of course, because this topic was focused on Ukraine and the EU, with a lot of the historical context and what's going on today with the war, I wasn't able to go into much detail in this video. If you're looking to get a much deeper understanding of what's going on in Ukraine, its history with Russia and how the war has progressed since the invasion, I would highly recommend Modern Conflicts, the Nebula original series by my friend Real Life Lore. There are five full-length episodes specifically about the conflict in Ukraine, including one that was actually made before the 2022 invasion. There are also several other related topics about Russia and its other wars in recent years, all of which ties into what's going on in Ukraine. This series is up to about 30 full length videos now, or about 14 hours worth of professional documentary quality content. Because these videos all deal with topics involving war, conflict and terrorism, they wouldn't work on YouTube. There would always be fears about videos being age restricted and demonetized. This isn't a concern on Nebula, since we the creators own the platform. Nebula features a lot of other amazing creators like Wendover Productions, Legal Eagle and Real Engineering, all of whom have exclusive content you won't find on YouTube. All videos on Nebula are ad-free and sponsor-free. In addition, you also get access to Nebula classes when you sign up with my link. You can learn a wide variety of things like animation, persuasive writing or even how to sue like a lawyer. If you sign up to the annual plan using my link, you can get 40% off the subscription price. That works out to just $2.50 per month. Signing up to Nebula with my link is the best way to support this channel and the videos I make. You can sign up by clicking the button on screen now or the link at the top of the video description. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.